If we could open our Bibles uh, beginning with uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Paul writes, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And then if we go back in the Old Testament to Psalm 84, mm -hmm. one of the Psalms of the sons of Korah. Some say this was written while in exile in Babylon, starting with verse 5, Psalm 84, verse 5. How blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. And then uh, in Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 6, starting with verse 19. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And then finally, in 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 3, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we come into your presence with thanksgiving and praise because you've given us such a standing in your son. There's no way we could have attained this, but you've given it to us as a gift and we worship you. Lord, only you can reveal the things that are on your heart. There's nothing I can say, uh, nothing we've read or anything like that that can, can reveal you except for you. And so we appeal to you this morning that you would reveal your heart to us and what you've done for us through Jesus Christ. Lord, we commit this time to your Holy Spirit. Illuminate, Lord, what's on your heart to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, like all good teachers, you start with a little review, right? Um, I'm just going to read what I started with last time. I printed it out so I, I remember it word for word. <laughs> and as you know, uh, my subject is hope. And it's not hope as in um, just a thing. But it's in what our hope is as Christians. God has given us a hope. And hope, we talked about last time, as being a favorable and confident expectation. Not a wish, but an expectation. It's not myopic or nearsighted. It has to do with the future and what is, at the moment, unseen. And I likened it to baseball spring training. Everybody has the hope of winning the pennant. But they can't see further down the line, but their hope is there. A Christian's hope is given to him by God. It's an expectation God gives me concerning his plan and his purpose for me. And we could say for the whole church. It gives purpose to my life. It gives me a higher perspective to why he saved me. In other words, our hope doesn't depend on who we are or what we have or where we might be. It's a gift 
from the sovereign God, and he calls us into it. Our hope is not just that we go to or be in heaven, but our hope is to be transformed into those spirits of just men made perfect who dwell in the heavenly city of Zion. Hope is meant to be realized. That is the reason it was given. And God never gives a false hope. Now today, we want to look at this hope as our being glorified. And remember, that was the whole thing of, of last time. We, we look at things as we see ourselves justified, we see ourselves called, but how little we see ourselves glorified in Christ. You know, in his glory, shining with his glory because he shares it with us. How little we do that. And yet this is very, really what God has meant for us when he saved us, is to share in that glory of his son who is the beginning of a new creation. This is what is, is for us. This is what is meant for us as Christians. And so I'd like to, this morning, I would like to bring, how, how does this play out? How does this hope play out? How does it, I don't want to say get accomplished, but how is it realized? How do we realize it? How are we brought through to the trans transformation we see of these Spirits of just men made perfect. How does that happen to me? You know, how does that happen to you? How do we come into the hope of this glory? And so I want to start out with a parable, not a biblical parable. Okay, I'm not going to read some parable from the Bible, but my own made up parable. Okay? And you know, a parable is to illustrate something, it's to illustrate a, tr a truth by using an earthly story. So I'm gonna use an earthly story that actually happened, okay? So it's, maybe it's more of an allegory than a parable, but you guys that know language can decide which it is. And really I wanna preface it by saying, when we think of 2 Corinthians, the verse I read, 3.18 and Psalm 84, that's what refers to this story. Okay. Now, um, you know, when I, when I was a young man in high school, I played basketball. And this isn't a story about me. This is a story about this year. Um, our high school was a football school. Basketball was, a, was an afterthought. And uh, our, our school was known for... The, League champions almost every year, our high school football team. Basketball, basketball wasn't bad, but it wasn't a champion. It was never a champion, never there. And uh, we had a good season my junior year, and coming back my senior year, I think the coach had high, high expectations for us. But I remember when, uh, uh, this was 1970, so it's, what, 53 years ago. <laughs> I'm 55. Uh, <laughs> um, and we came out, out, out of the summer, I remember, that was the first year at, at school, our dress code uh, was uh, made more lax. For the first time, uh, uh, men could have, or, or boys, guys could have facial hair, and we could have hair below our collar, you know? Uh, we could, uh, we could wear shorts if we wanted to. You couldn't wear shorts in those days unless it was Ber Bermuda Day. You guys remember that? You guys old people like me. Um, and I remember uh, the first day of school, I remember our, one of our starting guards, Mike Keith, man, he had a full beard. He, here he's, he's like 17, he's got this huge beard. It's really cool looking. Um, and I, uh, I had a, I don't remember, you guys that are my age, remember the movie Billy Jack? No, nobody does. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, William. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mort. I had a Billy Jack Indian reservation hat. Okay. And I had a head bound around it, and I decorated it. And we, we came to school 
and my coach saw us, and, and he called us into his office, me and this guy with a beard. And he was just like, what are you guys doing? You know, here he, he comes to Mike, you come with a beard? And he, and he said to me, and you, you, you come like some Indian out of a Western. <laughs> and I remember he was really upset. And I think it's because he felt like, you know, these guys, there's such promise that I have for them. And, and I'm looking at them, and I don't think they, they realize. And so that was it. And this is, what I, this is what he did. You know, so the season didn't start until, uh, we couldn't practice until November 1st. Uh, and uh, and uh, colleges could uh, start October 15th. And so just before our season started, my, my coach was captain of the 1952-53 UCLA Bruins basketball team. Now, for those of you that know, I know you younger kids, you have no idea, but those of us that are old age, UCLA was the cream. You couldn't get any better. Matter of fact, when I was in high school, from, from 1964 to 1975, that's 12 years, they won 10 NCAA championships. 10 out of 12 years. And in between those 12 years, they won seven in a row. Seven championships in a row. The New York Yankees didn't even win seven World Series in a row. This is the greatest feat you can see. And in 1970, they had just won 67, 68, 69, and the 19th, they had just had their fourth win in a row. And so everybody knew, you know, UCLA. And our coach decided to uh, take a group of us to watch them practice. And it was an awesome experience. You know, uh, he took us, I remember we went in Mr. Reed. Remember Mr. Reed's? He had a, he had a motor home. And there were about seven or eight of us guys who went in the motor home. And we went to the practice. And there we are in Poly Pavilion. The, the royalty of, of gyms for basketball. You see, you see the banners of their championships up there. Out on the, on the floor, there are a couple of All-Americans. And then Johnny Wooden, the Wizard of Westwood, comes up to our coach and calls him by his first name. Barry, it's good to see you. Man, we were floored. We were just going. You know, he knows our coach, you know. You think, you know, I, I was captain of the 50s. Yeah, coach, right. And then you, but you see him so familiar. And our mouths dropped. And now we're watching practice. And as we're watching practice, all the drills that we do, they're doing. All those drills. They're practicing the offense we run. Oh, because we're running their offense, <laughs> you know. The press, the man-to-man -man defense, everything was like that. It was, everything you could think of was just amazing. And when we left that gym and we, we went out and we were riding home, a couple of us had an epiphany. We saw something. And what we saw was um, we saw that I don't want to say that we were, were them, but we saw us in them. You know what I mean? We, we, we saw it, 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 it as it was. We were them, and they were us. It was an amazing thing. And all of a sudden, uh, that uh, what's wrong with you guys in us? And a few of us, not everyone, but there are a few of us that caught this, caught this little epiphany, this little vision. And we started to say, we're champions. We looked at them and they were champions. He said, that's us. We're champions. Now, you know, uh, 
Just because you see something doesn't mean necessarily that it is right there or that it's just going to be handed to you. Because this was before our season started, right? So how can you be a champion at the beginning of a season? You can't. Why not? Because you haven't played the season. And so the whole idea was we had seen ourselves as champions. We saw the end of the picture. And the only thing we had, we had to go through the things that brought us to that place. And you know, that's the whole idea of being brought. You know, I don't want to use it as a process and make it mechanical. But there's a whole life to be lived. There's a whole season to go through that brings you to that place. We had to go to do our conditioning. Nobody likes conditioning. We want to play the games. No. The first, what, four weeks, is all, oh, three weeks, all conditioning. All we're doing is running and running and running. And then you have uh, the preseason practices. You haven't even played a game yet. You're doing all these practices where you're learning the press or you're re refining the press, refining the offense, and doing all those things that you're supposed to do. And then that vision is tested. How? By the games you play. We had uh, 11 preseason games, uh, a potential 11 preseason games, and we made it through the 11. Then we had a, a league season, another 14 games. And every week, at least twice a week, that vision was tested. That vision was tested. Now, the other, the other thing that goes with this is the idea that what was going to get us through, we had a coach. We had a coach who knew how to get us there because he had gone through it before himself. He was a forerunner. He was a forerunner to that glory. And like the Holy Spirit, he knew how to lead us through the things we were going to go through to the end, which he had in store for us. And all we had to do was trust him. And in trusting him, that meant to submit to what he had to do. And it gave us, when we went into that, uh, coming back from uh, that, that time at Poly Pavilion, we, we gained a whole new respect for our coach. A respect that he could have gotten no other way, in my, in my thinking, than by bringing us to there. We had such a new respect for him. And, and such, because of that, there was a, a, a submission to his tutelage. Instead of just, you know, we'll play the games we want. No, there was a submission to this. And, and, there was, and, it, was, and it was saying, we trust him because he was with John Wooden. You know? He was like his son. How can we not trust him? And so we went into the season, and uh, you know, it's, it's not that. You know, you, you go to the season, you play the games, then you practice, and you, you hone in on your weaknesses, and you do that all through the basketball season. But another thing happened. In the 1970s, well, 1960s, late 1960s, when Lou Alcindor, who was Kareem Jabbar, played for the Bruins, they started to televise the Bruin games on Friday and Saturday, because they played their games on Friday and Saturday night, and they would televise their games on tape delay. So you could get home at 10 o'clock and watch the Bruins play. And uh, so, like, our games were on, I believe, Tuesdays and, and Fridays. So after we would have a victory, it wasn't just to soak in your victory and go, oh, yeah, we're the greatest, because it never got to that. But it got to this. We would get home on Friday night, and instead of going out and partying, you know what we did? Turned on the tape delay of the Bruins. And you know, that fortified that vision. That's us. We're them. We're champions just like them. And it just fortified. And can you see that as being like in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3? 
were beholding, as in a mirror, the glory. You know, that image that we're being transformed into. We're being transformed by game, by game, by game into this thing that we've seen. And it's glorious to us. And it goes from glory to glory, from game to game, from practice to practice. It's being played out. But the whole thing is, when we saw that practice, that first practice, what happened to us was all of a sudden there was a highway built in our heart, a highway to that championship. Just like for these, these sons of Korah, a highway to Zion being built in their hearts that helps them because there's this highway that leads them through hard times and high times, but leads them through all the way to where they're supposed to be. And you know, um, we were champions three times. Now, we didn't get the final championship. We lost one game that year, and it's the last one. It was, it was a quarterfinals of the state tournament. And uh, yeah, that was a blow. But we won two tournament championships, and one of them was the uh, biggest uh, high school basketball tournament west of the Mississippi at that time. And then we won our league, and we were undefeated all the way through. 25, we won 20, 25 games before we went to the playoffs, and then we won 27 games in a row. So the whole idea is this is how we're brought through. We see what we're to be, and the, and the Lord gives us or begins to build a highway in our heart to say, I can travel this highway. And you go step by step. You reach the destination not by being translated all the way to the end, but you have to go through the life that brings you to the place where you stand before God in Zion, complete. So that's my parable. And uh, now we want to say that we want to look at this. This is how we're brought. This is the way we're brought through. But the other, there's a, just a couple other things I want to bring up. This hope that God has given us. You know, the hope for us in being a, a, a championship, it wasn't sure. The hope God gives us is sure. It's a sure hope. It doesn't mean we have to go through things. The thing is, the end is sure. And we must see, we must, as Christians, see that it is secured for us, that this hope has been secured for us. Sure means this. It's certain, and it's secure. Why is it certain and secure? <coughs> because the author of this hope is God. And so hope is a, is a double-edged sword. Hope is the thing we're hoping for, but it's also the one who will, in the one who will bring us there. And so we have the hope of that championship we also have the hope, the trust in the one who is leading us to it. We, we trust him implicitly. And this God is sovereign. Now I want to bring up this, this point about God's sovereignty. More often than not, when I think of God's sovereignty, I think of him overruling things. You know, he overrules a government. He overrules a circumstance. He overrules a weakness that I might have. You know, he overrules my enemies and their designs on me. That's how I think mostly of, over, uh, of God's sovereignty. Uh, and that is a part of his sovereignty. But there's an aspect of sovereignty, of God's sovereignty, that does not overrule. 
instead of overruling, he acts to bring us through things that are obstacles, things that are against us. He doesn't, like I say, necessarily overrule. He doesn't remove them from our path, but he brings us through things. And we overcome these things because of the hope that is within us and the God who has given us that hope. Now notice I'm tying them together. We have the hope. The hope alone doesn't get us there. It's the hope in the hope. You know, I, well, I don't say that because it's wrong. It's the hope in the one who's given us the hope. That's what brings us through to the hope given. Tongue twister. For example, let me give you an example of this. You know, when Jesus went to the cross for us and for his father, death wasn't overruled. God didn't overrule death. He didn't let Jesus be on the cross and go, okay, that's enough. You're, you're willing. No. Matter of fact, death took Jesus into himself. He took him into himself and kept him there for three days. Death wasn't overruled. But on the third day, Jesus Christ overcame death through the resurrection. It's a big difference. You know, death isn't overruled. It's overcome in victory. That's why death worries your sting. This is why last time I talked about the hope of the resurrection is we don't fear death anymore. We don't fear man. We don't fear death. It has no hold on us because through Christ we overcome death, even if we die physically. And that's where all those martyrs I was talking about who went to, to the stake or to the, to the gallows or to the firing squad, and they went not frightened about their dying, but went knowing they were going to meet the Lord and be in his presence and share in his glory. Now, we can look at this uh, idea of God's sovereignty playing out this way in the life of Joseph. We see this aspect of God's sovereignty in Joseph's life. You know, Joseph was given a hope. And to him, that hope was sure because God gave him that dream twice. So it wasn't just a fluke one time. He gave it to him again. He said, this is true. This is real. This is really going to happen. And uh, so he went and he, yeah, he bragged about his hope. Okay, that's what most of us do. We brag about things. Um, and his hope was challenged. His hope was challenged by so many contrary circumstances. Um, the ill will of his brothers toward him. That challenged his hope. This guy's going to rule over us. Let's kill him and see if he rules over us. Yeah, okay. He was sold into slavery. Okay, let's see him rule over us as a slave. Ain't going to happen. He was thrown into prison. He was forgotten. Remember the baker who said, I'll remember you for fair. Well, I forgot you for two years. Oops. And it wasn't that everything was contrary, because during this time also, he, he knew God's blessing him. He knew God's favor during this time of trial, during this time of contrariness. He knew God was, he still had God's favor. What a wonderful thing that helps you go through things. You know that you have the favor of God on you while you're going through things that are so contrary and which scream out to say, if God really cared for you, if God really is going to bring this hope, these things wouldn't be happening. But no, he went through them. And uh, God saw him through all these things through to the throne of Egypt, where he sat on the throne of Egypt. It's an amazing thing, from slave to throne. And, you know, you think about this, when Joseph was sold into slavery, I think he was 17. 
when he, had, when he gave Pharaoh his dreams, he was 30. When he first saw his brothers after two years of famine, he was 37. It's a long time, isn't it? And yet, did the hope come true? Was the hope a true hope? Was it a secure hope? Yes, by God's doing, by God's sovereignty. And the hope, that, uh, you know, that, and in this whole process, a transformation took place in Joseph. Just like the transformation that we're looking forward to, a transformation took place in Joseph. And that transformation uh, showed him that the hope that was given to him wasn't just for him. It, in other words, it wasn't just to be lavished on him. It was for a purpose. And the purpose was, you know, that God wants to save much people alive. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. When his brothers were thinking he was going to come down hard after Jacob was buried, he said, you know, you meant it for me for evil. But God meant it for good. And the good that God meant it for isn't that I'm sitting on this throne. It's that he might save many people alive. And that included his brothers who did him wrong. Whole transformation of heart for Joseph. Little kid thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on top of the world. God, through all the things, transformed him to a humble man. A humble man who God could show his compassion through. And he embraced that. You know, Joseph embraced the role that he had there. That was the spirit of this man made perfect. Now, sometimes it's not our, our circumstances uh, that are against our hope being realized. Uh, sometimes it's just us. It's our own failures, our own propensity to sin, our own falling. You know, and in thinking about this, let's consider the Apostle Peter. You know, Apostle Peter had a hope, and it wasn't just to be fishers of men. But if you look in, uh, I think it's uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 30, when they're arguing about who the greatest, and the Lord talks to them about the greatest will be the servant, and this is at the Last Supper, he also said to them, but you will sit on the 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. That was an expectation for Peter. Wow, what a glorious thing, huh? Sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Wow. But you know, by the end of the chapter, he denied his Lord three times. Didn't even get out of the chapter. You know, three times he denies his Lord. And it says he went out and wept bitterly. What a bitter pill to swallow. Our own inadequacies, our own self-strength being the very thing that we thought would carry us through is the very thing that keeps us from. What a bitter pill to swallow. And no spoonful of sugar helps that pill go down. Nothing. And that's why he wept bitterly. That was, if I cannot do it, how can it be done? I am hopeless. Oh. But hallelujah. God has given us a great high priest. A great high priest. As our high priest, we see Jesus going before us into the presence of God the Father as our high priest, taking his blood as a propitiation for sin and presenting it before God the Father in that heavenly sanctuary, thus sealing our forgiveness for our sins, and thus sealing our redemption. You know, again, this is the sovereignty of God. And the sovereignty of God isn't that he overrules sin. He doesn't overrule. He doesn't say, well, I'm going to make a new law. And that way it'll over, override this because I can do it. I'm sovereign. He doesn't do that. 
But what he does is he takes sin and he judges it in the flesh in Jesus Christ on the cross. <clears throat> and uh, where he suffered and died. And it, it, what he says is the wages of sin are just. It means death. And uh, I will pay sin its just wages. That's the sovereignty of God. I will pay sin its just wages. And in doing that, that debt is paid in full. And the account with sin is settled forever. <coughs> forever. Praise yes, praise the Lord. It's settled forever. And this is one of the things we really need to grasp. You know, I know we want so much after sinning to do penance. I must do some works to prove God that I really am sorry for my sins. You know, we were, uh, we were studying uh, the prodigal son, or as Jerry was going to say, correct me and say the profligate son. Um, but in that, the son rehearsed before he came. He said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants, and I'll serve you. When the prodigal gets home and his father sees him, he goes to the place saying, I've sinned against heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to, to be your son. The rest of that, what he said, I'm no longer, you know, let me be one of your servants. He never got a chance to say that. You read it. He never had a chance to say it. Why? Because the father embraced him and took him to himself. And that's with us. If we only see, like this morning, how it was, I think Gunther read it, it was his, his good pleasure for adopting us. It's his good pleasure. Oh, could we see how pleasurable it is for him to bring us to himself through the blood of Christ. This is not something that he's going, oh, i got to do this. No, he's rejoicing. He's rejoicing just like the father in the parable. And he's saying we must make merry. Wasn't that just so opposite of us? No, no, i got to do peasants. i got to do the 12, uh, the 12 labors of Hercules before I, before I get in here. No. The father welcomes us in through the blood of Christ. That is, the blood of Christ is the great means of recovery. It's the great means of restoring us, not just to God, but to the hope that he's given us, the blood of Christ. It can never, it is never an elementary thing. It is a magnificent thing. We can never, we're, we've been reading normal Christian life, it, it can never uh, say, well, I'm past needing the blood of Christ. That's for, for young Christians. It's for all of us. Forever. We will never, we will never outlive our need, our worth, our, our thing of worth of the blood of Christ. And isn't it interesting that when you go in, in, into a revelation, what do you see? You always see a lamb as if slain. Why? Because the blood of Christ ever speaks. When Jesus rose from the dead, what do you see? His wounds. His wounds are there. Charles Wesley writes, five bleeding wounds he bears, received on Calvary's tree. They pour effectual prayers. They strongly plead for me. What a wonderful thing has been given to us. We have a high priest who doesn't take a lamb, but it takes his own offering, the offering of his own blood, and brings it before the Father. And it's that blood that is a propitiation. That, that is the blood that atones for us. That is the only blood that atones for us. It is the blood that cleanses our conscience and allows us to freely now come before God. Clean conscience. You know, it's, it's nice to be forgiven. 
But it's even better to having been forgiven to have your conscience clear because of the blood of Christ. Not because of I made up for it, but because of the blood of Christ. The blood of someone and the blood of another shed for me. And as I priest, he intercedes for us. When Peter said, you know, uh, uh, I'll be there for you, Lord. And he said, you know, he said, Satan has demanded, has demanded to sift you as wheat. Uh, there's that sovereignty of God again, allowing the demand of Satan to be fulfilled. Peter was for three days sifted as wheat. I don't, I don't even want to enter into whatever he had to go through in his own heart and mind. But some of us have gone through things that to us are just that bad. But Satan has demanded this of you, but I have prayed for you that your faith fails not, that you come through. And when you have come through, strengthen your brethren. Wow. God has given us a great high priest who intercedes. Thank God for help from heaven. Not just help that, that had come down from heaven, but having come down from heaven, having died and having rose again and ascended in heaven, still pleads for us. What a wonderful Savior we've been given. This is the mercy of God, and this is the mercy of that secures that hope. I will not let this poor ransomed sinner die. How wonderful it is to know that we're secured, not only by an offering, but by the prayers of an ever-living high priest who has on his heart the will and the pleasure of his Father and also the hope of us carries on his heart. Not only on his heart, but also on his shoulders because the names of those 12 tribes are on his shoulders. He bears us before God. How wonderful. He is able to bear us before God. All that we are able to bear us. Now hope is also an anchor. And I'm just about done here. There are two ways an anchor uh, was used, and that, uh, there could be more, but I, I, I saw two. One is an anchor uh, keeps you moored. And moored means it keeps you in the, in the dock. So if uh, John gave a message years ago, and I still have it on my refrigerator, don't drift. Remember that? Okay, keep, anchor keeps you from drifting keeps you from going this way or that way. But also, you want to be moored during a storm because a, a lot of shipwreck, if you watch the hurricane, a lot of shipwreck comes from that tidal surge and brings those boats miles inland and they're all cracked up. So, you know, hopefully this anchor keeps you moored in there, uh, in, the, uh, in the harbor during a storm. An example of this uh, mooring, Margaret Barber uh, wrote a hymn. We have it in our hymnal. It's called Wrecked Outright. And it's like four verses. And, and in this, it's a story about uh, a boat, and the boat is a, a metaphor for, for her or for Christians uh, that's weathering, weathering or has weathered a storm. And there's a, a verse, I think it's verse 3, where after going through such seas, after going through such a storm, the trials of life that she uh, went through, and they were, for her, they were devastating. Ruined her reputation. She had to leave uh, the mission society that she was at, and uh, just her reputation was railroaded. Hard thing. And so when she went back to China, she went on her own, you know, uh, uh, you could say almost disgraced, but in the will of God. But she infers, my hope is secure 
because I'm anchored to infinity. I'm anchored to something, to someone who's greater than me, who's greater than my trials, greater than my ambitions, greater than my hopes. I'm anchored to infinity. I'm anchored to an infinite and living God. In other words, she is saying, if not for these very things that I had to go through, or not, not that I had to go through, that I went through, I would have never known not only the vastness of the, power of the power of God to keep me through trial, but the depths of his compassion and commitment to me in bringing me through to his end. You know, sometimes we are lost in the power of God. Don't let us be lost in the power of God to the exclusion of his great compassion and commitment to see us through. Oh, how God loves us. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. Reaches past the farthest star and where? To the lowest hell. What a wonderful God we have. She was brought to see this anchoring. She was anchored to him in complete and utter trust. Or as Glenn said this morning, unreasonable trust. There's no reason for it other than what? The love of God for me. That he would bring me into his very purposes. How wonderful is this God who has saved us and given us hope. Also an anchor is used uh, to draw a ship through a narrow channel into a harbor. And in this, what you would have is you would have a narrow, and you couldn't trust the ship to get through, so they would send a boat ahead of them with an anchor. And it would go through that channel, and then it would put the anchor on some rock strong enough to hold, and then the boat would be pulled into harbor. You know, so the anchor would be, or the anchor would be used as something to draw. Not just something, to, just to hold, but something to draw. And we have a forerunner who has gone through the veil. Now, you know, we can look at the veil as a number of things, the veil of his flesh, the veil that keeps a man out of the holy of holies. But a lot of times, I think the veil is what's unknown ahead of us. We don't know what's ahead of us. But we have a Savior who has gone through everything that a man could have, could have conceived of going through. You know? Did he know loss? Yes. His, uh, Joseph, his, his, his what, uh, as Catholics, we call him his foster father, died. The one who acted as his father died. He knew loss. He knew things against him. His brothers didn't believe in him. Herod was after him. Uh, Pharisees and scribes, they didn't jive with his teaching. They were against him. He knew things against him in every way. He knew the powers of, of uh, the heavens against him and Satan and all the demons and stuff like that that he uh, encountered. He knew all of that. <clears throat> he knew sickness because he took it from people. And he knew death because he suffered it. He knows the whole unknown. And he's gone through the veil of unknown for us to say, I've made it through. I've overcome and I remember last time I talked about at the transfiguration, he could have walked right into heaven. But it wasn't the will of God that he go into heaven without bringing many sons to glory. And this is the way as forerunner, he brings many sons to glory. He goes ahead of us. He trods the pilgrim way that we are to trod. He goes through that and he brings us to its end. 
And I'll close with this. What's the effect that hope has on one, on the one who hopes? It's not that we go, oh, it's secured and everything. I'll just relax now and just let him pull me through. He secures it, but I think the men in the ship pull the ship in because it's very weighty. He who has this hope purifies himself. Let's clarify purifies. You know, we think of purifies, I got I to gotta be better. I got to be better. This is not what it's saying. Let's look at it this way. He who has this hope makes himself ready. And in this context, have you ever heard of a hope chest? In the old days, not only was it known as a hope chest, it was a glory box. That's an interesting term, isn't it, a glory box? And hope chests are not new. I mean, they've been around since the Renaissance, and some people say even before that. My mom had a hope chest. Uh, it was made out of cedar. And the thing about making a hope chest out of cedar was, first of all, cedar is so fragrant. It's a beautiful smell. It even overcomes mothballs. You know, you open that thing, you don't smell the mothballs. The first thing you smell is you smell the cedar. It's a fragrant thing. It's a fragrance of life. The other thing is resistant to, uh, what can I say, to insects who would uh, help it rot. But the, the thing about a hope chest was it used to be, and especially when we think of, of, of our culture, if you went back to the 1800s especially, um, it used to be that women who were looking ahead to their wedding had the hope of being married. Okay? They'd buy a chest like this, or they'd have it made, or maybe their dad would make it, or a brother. And uh, she would fill it with everything she deemed was important to her anticipated marriage. Some women would make their own wedding dress. And as they made it, they would put it in that hope chest, sometimes taking it out and adding something to it, something they thought of later. But they put that in there in anticipation of that day. And then they would look like, well, I'm going to live. I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to live. I'm not just going to have the ceremony. Got to live with my husband. So what do I need? And so she might buy fine china. You know, how many of you, now, now what do you do? You go, you put yourself on, uh, on a list at, a, at Target or something like that. And, <laughs> Uh, well, you know, that shows you where my, my social class is. Uh, but um, fi fine china, linen, tablecloths, sheets, those types of things that you're going to need, silverware, all sorts of odds and ends that you would need, that you would keep, or little knickknacks that, are, are, that mean something to you that you want to bring into your marriage. And sometimes they bring in an album of pictures and photographs of the family to remember their heritage. And the thing is, all this was then stored away. And not, not, when I say stored away, I don't mean like the lost ark being put in Washington, D.C., and they put it with all these other things. Um, but every once in a while, you come back and you open it up and you look at it. And by looking in it, it's a reviving of that hope. I ho my hope is revived. I'm looking at the dress I'm going to wear. Oh, this is going to be wonderful. When we have his parents over for the first time, I'm going to set this china before them on this linen. Oh, our bed's going to be made up of these. Our couches are going to be, you know. The whole thing is I'm looking forward. My hope is renewed. And it's stored and put, put away in preparation for that day. Preparation, not storage. 
Okay? It's a different storage. You, it's, you go in my attic, it's storage. You know? I still got the kids' Legos. But this is preparation. Preparation for what is to come. The waiting for that day was not a passive wishing, but an active participation in what was to come. You know, uh, it was a glorious day when I got married. And to see my wife come down the aisle in her gown, she was radiant. Radiant. Her gown was purchased by her mom. Radiant. This is what the Lord is looking for. Radiant bride. Prepare your gown. You know, in Revelation it talks about the ornamentation of the bride's gown is works of righteousness of the saints. Oh, Lord, how wonderful it is to know that we can adorn the gown, not for merit, but out of love for the one who is coming to marry us. What a wonderful thing. Uh, seeing our hope is sure and drawing near in anticipation of it, may it become that desire in our own hearts for this hope to be realized. May it be that highway to Zion created in our hearts for that better day ahead. This is our hope. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. And I just want to add to that, appears before God in Zion complete. Complete. Nothing lacking. The just men, the, just, the spirits of just men made perfect. Amen. Let it be so. just want to end with this little couple of verses. I love hymns because they say things that you can't. Because these people have experienced something that I haven't. In uh, number 863, which is right next to the one that I read last time by Darby, this one's by Francis Beaven, who writes children's uh, biographies. She's done one on the Wesleys. <clears throat> and it's called No More in Earthen Vessels. And verse 4 starts out, Undimmed, and this is talking about the glory of Jesus. Undimmed, in that great vessel, the glory of that light, illumining with its fullness the earth and radiance bright, all his new creation, God's glory there shall see, the vessel for that shining, the Lamb's own bride shall be. Spirits of just men made perfect. Oh, Lord, beat death. No, don't be it. Bring that to our hearts and our minds more and more. Father, we thank you for such a hope that is ours. But not that we have just such a hope, but Lord, that you, you have secured it for us. You have been the one who can bring us all the way through. It's because of who you are, your sovereignness, your power and your might, but your commitment and your great love toward us. You have secured for us what is unimaginable and what we, something we could never have had on our own should we have a thousand lives to live. Oh, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the anchor that you've given us that anchors us, that holds us to you forever and that draws us to you that we might be complete in you and brought through all the things that are mysteries to us, that we can't see ahead of us. Oh, Lord, you have gone through as our forerunner to bring us through. Oh, how we praise you. How we thank you. We have such hope, and we have such a God who gives it to us. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.